Bilderberg. Shh. It's meant to be a secret. When you hear the name Bilderberg, visions of blacked out limos with nebulous silhouettes of luminaries like David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and Hillary Clinton might come to mind. But despite the ultra high profile of the guests, 95% of the global major media outlets have never ever mentioned its name. Tonight, we're going to find out how and why and who are the major players in this shadowy cabal as we go on the edge. Bilderberg, who are they, what are they, and how have they become able to rule the global social political scene without any public scrutiny, totally under the radar for so long? And what have they got planned for us serfs and vassals in 2012? To help us navigate these questions and to get some answers, we're joined by a very special guest this evening. Among other things, he's on the writing team of Channel 4's 10 o'clock live and eight out of ten cats, but he's also a journalist. He's one of the only journalists who has covered the Bilderberg meeting for The Guardian over the last three years. Let's welcome Charlie Skelton. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Patrick. Hello. So, let's get right down to it. Yeah. Bilderberg, what is it? And uh, who are its members? What's, what's the history of it? Well, it's a, that's a very big question. Fortunately, we've got a bit of time. It's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous thing that doesn't get written about, that's one thing. It's a huge security operation uh, that occurs once a year. Uh, but in practical terms, it's a, it's a group of people, a small group of people, uh, called uh, the Bilderberg Steering Committee, that enlarges once a year to incorporate maybe 130, 140 people. Uh, and they go and sit in a, um, uh, an exclusive uh, heavily guarded uh, hotel somewhere in the world uh, behind a, a big police cordon with helicopters flying over and they spend three days uh, having a conference and it's a very it's a proper conference you know they have their lanyards they have their their table outside where they pick them up and they have a, a, Dele a delegate badges. their delegate badges and it's a proper it's a, it's a you know they've got a schedule and they keep to it you can see them coming out for a cigarette every so often uh, if you've got a long lens and um, so it's, it's, it's often written off as a talking shop uh, by, by some people that would like to diminish its importance. Uh, but its actual importance can simply be divined from the, from the list of people that uh, attend. And that are now, now they admit attend. And uh, uh, it's an extraordinary who's who of uh, the, the power players in international finance, industry, uh, in, in intelligence, and... Uh, uh, and media ownership, and um, d uh, and uh, with a little sprinkling of uh, European royalty. Uh, for good this, is, this this isn't just any ordinary summit, and also that's one I want you to explain uh, to our viewers. This isn't any ordinary meeting. You know, like the G8 or the G20, mm. you have the heads of state there, and you have the public faces of mm. public policy. This is something very different, um, just by the nature of the attendees and and the way. The, the who's on this list? This, this isn't just uh, people from one industry. Yeah. These are, these are the, me the major media moguls. These are the political movers and shakers, the future presidents of America, or vice presidential candidates, um, key people in key positions. Yeah. There's a little habit they have of uh, managing to invite uh, people to Bilderberg the year before they take high office. Uh, you know, for example, uh, David Cameron. Yep. Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, uh, you know, the, and I, I heard a story that um, you know they Tony always Blair. they always invite the, uh, the 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 prospective U.S. president to Bilderberg, the, the two or the year or the two years before he might be running for right. his party's nomination. And basically, when Bill Clinton was there in uh, whatever uh, 1991 or 1990, he was op he, they make them open doors and yeah. you know bring the water to the table, almost mm. like 
you know, the, the, you yeah, know these are your new bosses, yeah. and this is, this is Mr. Clinton or Mr. Obama. There's a really interesting quote, actually, from Clinton, which you can look up, uh, which is, he's talking about the fact, that his campaign manager, and I just can't remember the name, there's too many names. His uh, campaign, James Carville? Possibly, invited him, sort of took him along to, to Bilderberg and said, you know, here's the new guy, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And, he, and Clinton says it was at that point he kind of realized he'd, he'd gone up a level and uh, he was suddenly, you know, the, the kind of hand of the lottery had come down and gone, it yeah. could be you. And uh, so, yes, so... So uh, Tony, he, Tony Blair was at Bilderberg? Yeah, and he's lied, he's, what, what, he's lied to he, Parliament about, about going, which is quite serious. When was he there? Uh, okay, uh, I can't remember. But There's too many facts. Before he was PM? I think or? it's the year before. So oh, before he became PM. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, in America, the Logan Act forbids um, public servants from, uh, you know, non-state yeah. meetings uh, with foreign entities, uh, elected officials, are, they're forbidden well, by U.S. law. Your James Steinberg, Deputy Secretary of State, was there last year. He's on the list, and he was meeting in private with uh, uh, the U.K.'s Chancellor of the Exchequer, mm -hmm. George Osborne, who was there. Contrary to what they say, uh, they, 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 Bilderberg, uh, in whatever small amount of literature they have, their, their website, Bilderberg Meetings, um, they always stress, you know, that people are here in their private capacity. They're, they're here as private individuals. It's very much sort of Chatham House rules. We're just having a little chit-chat. Uh, however, I last year rang the, the Treasury whilst I was there in, in, in San Moritz and said, can you, because we had a photo, someone managed to get a photo of um, George Osborne coming through. Uh, in his limo, and I he said, can you confirm whether George Osborne, the Chancellor, is here? And if so, in what capacity is he attending this summit? And I spent a, a whole day, practically, on the phone to the Treasury, eventually being bumped around and bumped around and bumped around, and they came back with a response, which was, yes, he's here in an official capacity, which is an extraordinary thing. George Osborne was in St. Moritz last yeah, year. In, an, in, in his official capacity as Chancellor of the Exchequer for three days, one of his biggest... Uh, you know, you look at the Chancellor of the Exchequer's diary. A totally that's secret a meeting. That's a big a totally chunk. private meeting. Yeah. Secret with, with the, the heads of captains mm. of industry, the heads of state, or mm. former heads of state. George Osborne's there. Yeah. And Talk, when people talking say, about what? Well, you know, not making policy, as they yeah. insist upon. Uh, not making any decisions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when people say, you know, why, why are you at all bothered by this event, you know, why, why can't they just go and have a private chat? Well, precisely because my elected Chancellor of the Exchequer is there with a Treasury official for three days as Chancellor of the Exchequer with the head of Deutsche Bank, the head of Barclays, the head of HSBC, the head of Airbus, the head of Daimler, the he you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the head of the NSA, um, and reporting back not a single sentence about what he did there. Nothing, nothing. So that's just deeply inappropriate. And what I have found in my small number of years of going along and, and just sort of turning up and seeing what's going on is it's a constant uh, mind problem. I was going to say a rude word then. Uh, but uh, you, you get there and um, it, 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 I don't know if you know the phrase cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. And you're going, this, hang on. I've just seen, there's helicopters above me, there's armed police, there's more limousines than I've ever seen in my life. There's a, you know, where, depending where you are, there's a, you know, a Navy boat off the shore. And you turn around and you know, there's no, you look around and you think, where the, where's the press? Yeah. And you go, well, I don't understand. And I actually took two colleagues of mine uh, from, who work on dispatches, Channel 4 dispatches, and they're proper, you know, proper journalists, not unlike me, I'm just a, a hobbyist. But they're proper journalists and they, um, they work in current affairs, and that was their response. They, they were sort of going, this is a bit odd. Well, I don't at, understand where the press are. The, the, look at image 106, if we get that on screen. Um, you know, the mainstream media before 2010, I saw a few mentions of it in the Washington mm. Post. Uh, they blurbed it in the New York Times last year. Yeah. But before 2010, zero. So yeah. uh, explain about that image. Reuters, or yeah. you did a search for Bilderberg? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the whole Reuters news service and all its archives, how many results did we get? Yeah, zero. Zero. So okay. at the end, that's another part of that. You're, you're there, you think, well, presumably there's some kind of... This is, this is 
scratched its way into the kind of new mainstream news consciousness somehow. But you know, AP and Reuters, the people people think of as this kind of crystal clear, you know, out, outpouring of pure news, mm -hmm. don't mention it. And, and you sort of go, well, that's a bit weird. I don't really understand that. And um, my, my mother's 70, right? Yeah. And she didn't know about Bilderberg until two weeks ago when I mentioned it to right. her. And she was active politically her whole life. Yeah. In, in, at some time in Washington as well, when we were very young. I said she was just flabbergasted. Yeah. She's like, what? Who? Yeah. Bilderberg? Who are they? She heard Alex Jones yeah. talking about it on the radio. And uh, she's like, what is this Bilderberg? And, uh, you know, she, she's been alive since 1942. Okay, well, I spoke to someone. I, I, I mean, I, over and over again this happens. I spoke to the head of a TV reasonably big TV production company in the UK, who he will remain nameless. I was explaining to him that I was off to the Bilderberg conference, and we had this chat, and he couldn't really understand what I was talking about, because he thought I, it was the Builder Bear conference, and it was some conference about the toy Builder Bears. And that's as cl he'd never heard of Bilderberg. And, you know, I spoke to someone, uh, I rang up the uh, ITV forward planning of their, of their news, and, and I said, I'm, are you interested in covering the... Bilderberg conference and they went you know ah oh, the Bilderberg conference that rings a bell and and it's when you hear things like that you go it's not a, it, as much as there's a conspiracy to keep a lid on this story the lid's been kept on so well there's now a kind of conspiracy of ignorance mm. where people just don't know mm. they just don't know about this thing and I mean uh, I was talking to you before the show about I, I work on uh, the show 8 out of 10 cats and the host of it Jimmy Carr the comedian he said that last year it was on during when I was there in, in Sam Ritz, and he said, he said, well, look, this big conference is on. Why don't we do a joke about it? Let's do a, bag, a joke about it on the show. And I went, this is great, let's do that. Sat down to write a joke about it, and I suddenly realized in order to write a joke about it, you had to explain that the biggest, we would have had the biggest setup in joke history in order to explain to people what, this, what the punchline meant. Oh, yeah. uh, so, you know, that you can't even write a joke about it because people, it's not one of those things that you go, all right, it's that. Although, hopefully, that's changing. So, you've got an interesting story. Um, just tell us uh, your background. Were you? In, uh, I think you've been in comedy. Yeah. And you've been a writer. Yeah. And how did you get involved in Bilderberg? Tell us the story from the beginning, because it's a very, it's a very interesting story. You're you're in going into virgin territory as yeah. far as the media is concerned. Well, it was a, it was, a, I suppose I have two people to blame. My wife, for slightly nudging me in the direction of more interesting and uh, perhaps sceptical uh, um, news analysis, and also President Obama. And I remember. It was the night of the election, or he of his inaugural. What would you call it? Not the inaugural. Uh, when he'd won the election, and he gave his address to the, you know, where everyone's crying, crying with yeah. joy at this, at yeah. this, and this guy. And I was with him at that point. I was full on Obama. Thank God, Obama. Thank yeah. God, Obama. A lot of people were. Yeah, I was there, and I lost it on that night. And I, he gave a speech that was so hollow, that he he, he managed to destroy my faith in politics in mainstream politics right there with his speech, with his acceptance speech, with his, uh, and it was so bad and so empty and so not like a, a, a normal human being talking. Well, Michelle, know? Michelle and I are going to change the country and uh, we're going to fix all that. Yeah. So and, I just uh, went, oh God, what have I just been, I was sending, okay, genuinely, I was sending emails to David Axelrod, the head of his campaign going yeah, look yeah. I don't know if you need he's, any he's, jokes he's about... Obama's brain by the way yeah right David Axelrod yeah. that's Obama's official brain so anyway I, I fell out of love with that a few months later um, I just was you know I'd come across the Bilderberg conference a little bit and I um, uh, and I just thought to myself it's odd that no, the mainstream news don't cover it and then I thought hang on I remember walking along the road and going why don't I just do it why don't I just see whether I could manage to do it? And I just contacted the, someone I know at The Guardian and said, look, I don't know if you want this thing. I'll do, go and do a, a silly thing. I'll just turn up at this place, see what happens. You know, where, maybe where, it's was bit, it? where was it? That was in, uh, just outside Athens. In Greece, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, um, and they said, yeah, it might be funny. Yeah, what's this thing? This builder, builder what? So I went, yeah, okay, let's do that. And I went off and I was... The greatest minds at The Guardian had no idea. Well, I had no idea. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly, and this was from fairly high. No one really. Jonathan Steele had no idea. Yeah. But no one had. But Freeland had no idea. But in the in the defence, there wasn't really any reference to where it was, and I remember finding a little reference in a kind of internet forum going, "It's, we think it's in uh, Vuliagmania outside Athens," and I sort of went, "Okay, well this is worth a punt." Took myself off to Athens and thinking, "Oh, this will be funny. See what happens." And then, 
I entered a dystopian nightmare that uh, practically gave me a nervous breakdown. Let's show some images from your first trip to Bilderberg. Uh, 111. Let's cue up image 111. And uh, I think, uh, tell us what happened here. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that image is exactly where my life changed in terms of Bilderberg, in terms of uh, my relationship to What's going on uh, there? authority. Uh, that's that's uh, outside the hotel, that's some Greek police. And I stupidly took a photo of them. And from that point, I was just arrested, arrested, re-arrested, arrested, followed, uh, harrassed. Uh, they, threw you, they threw you in jail? Or they, endlessly. 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 They just what, threw you in let, and you got out? And just you, to turn down to the police station, put in there. I, it became, at one point, I took a photograph of a limousine's wheels as it went past, literally like this, with a little tiny digital, digital camera like that. Next thing you know, like Starsky and Hutch, they come up, you know, cars, motorbikes, I'm off down the police station again. Let's look at 112. T t tell us a little bit about this guy. And we'll, well, actually, we'll look at that after the break. But, um, yeah, we're going to go into uh, some of the uh, veteran alternative media that's covered Bilderberg and talk a bit more about your uh, your first experiences in Greece after the break. Will do. On the Edge in association with Uncensored Magazine. On the Edge in association with Uncensored Magazine. Welcome back to On the Edge. I'm here with my guest, Charlie Skelton, and we are talking about Bilderberg. And Charlie, I got a few texts from our uh, viewers out there, and one of them asks, uh, are there any other foreign journalists that you've run into at the Bilderberg meetings? And um, one person who I know comes to mind is Mr. Jim Tucker. So you cue 112, and uh, there's a good photo of Jim. Tell us a little bit about Jim, how you met him. Yeah, well, that's just after I met him. I took that photo myself, and... Uh... Uh, I just turned up here in this little seaside town outside Athens in 2009, and I wasn't sure whether, I genuinely had no idea whether I was in the right place, or whether there was any kind of a conference was going on, and then this figure just walked down the road wearing this big hat, and I thought, hang on, I think I've seen this guy before. With a cigarette. Yeah, I think I might be in the right place. Yeah. And that was Jim Tucker, who's been kind of build a bothering for decades now. Dec 30, 30, 40 years? Goodness knows, yeah. So he's got a, he's got a source inside Bilderberg, and of course, uh, you, a lot of people are familiar with Alex Jones has covered Bilderberg yeah. uh, judiciously for the last four or mm. five years. And um, so Alex works off of Jim Tucker's source. Yeah. Uh, and so Jim leaks to Alex what right. the agendas are going to be and right so forth. Um, I think that's pretty extraordinary that Jim Tucker's managed to uh, uh, preserve a source inside Bilderberg yeah. for 30 years. Yeah, remarkable. Yeah. I mean, I it's incredible. Then again, uh, you know, I, I might start saying, I've got a source in Bilderberg, and just start going, yeah, I think uh, here's her agenda. Yeah. Because who's yeah. going to say no? Yet? No, it isn't. <laughs> but anyway, no, no, but I, I'm sure he does. And, uh, yeah, he's an indomitable fellow. And um, there's, some other, there's some other people that have, uh, that have been kind of covering it for a few years and for, for longer than a few years. And um, there's a Swiss guy, Manfred, from a web, he's got a website, uh, which I'm going to... It's called All Smoke and Mirrors in, in mm -hmm. uh, German, Alice... Charles and Rauch, or whatever you say, and, uh, and I can't speak German, so that was, I apologize to the German language, what I just said. Um, and um, Daniel Estelin. Daniel Estelin, yeah. <laughs> Did you meet Daniel? Uh, kind of, yeah. he wrote the book, uh, Bilderberg, and that, that was yeah. kind of a, the f most people's first segue. Yeah, it's, and you know, the, it's a pretty good, I would recommend the book. I'd have a little, little pinch of salt around some of the things that he says about himself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's, he's, the information, the photographs, it's all good. Yeah. And uh, the documents he's got, that's all, it's all good. And it's very, it's, so if you were going to start we're not, we're somewhere. Not plugging, we're not plugging anyone's well, book. Well, plug it. But, you know what? Do you know what? I would plug it. But, but as a reference. But he, uh, yeah, I met, well, met him uh, last year. Uh, uh, well, I say I met him. Um, no, it was in, sorry, it was in um, Citrus uh, in 2010, where he decided to out me as an MI6 agent. <laughs> Well, you uh, know, in front of my wife. Uh, who, so the best of my, us, Charlie. My so. wife took him to task. I've, been, said, out, I've been outed as a um, MI, I've been accused of being MI6, MI5, CIA. Yeah. And, I, and I get these emails from people and I just, I, I, and I, I, I email them back and say, I really wish yeah. I had the second paycheck, yeah, yeah. to be quite honest. I could afford to buy a nice car or something. Yeah. But, Unless uh, they've done such a good mind control job on me that I just don't even know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're a sleeper. Yeah. The like, phone rings and I just... 
So I got another text from one of our viewers, um, Edge Text, is saying, Ed Miliband is likely to be the next British Prime Minister. And have you seen him or known of his attendance at any Bilderberg meetings? Uh, I'm going to betray my ignorance and pass on this one. Uh, uh, I can't remember. Goodness. I mean, well, perhaps, perhaps some of our viewers could, uh, David, could Google I that. I believe David has well, attended. David, right, yeah. David Miliband, okay, but, but yeah. not, to add not to my knowledge. Right. And, and this is another text that came in from one of our views. That's really a good question. This is getting back, bringing things down to, yeah. to, real, to real humanity a little bit. The security services and the police, like the ones that roughed you up in Greece, um, do they really know who they're guarding? Or are they well, completely oblivious to what's going on in the conference? A really interesting was in Spain, uh, what happened with the police, because... Um, a few days before, they had to stand in a long line around, you know, a kilometre cordon away from this luxury hotel. They were out on the streets marching uh, about their pay. Okay. So the police were. Yeah, and were so the, the Spanish activists were very good at telling, you know, talking to them about, you know, you know, you know, this is a bit weird. You, these are the guys that are screwing you, and you're here, and we're kind of on the, we're sort of on the same team, mm -hmm. and. There was actually, a, a, and I think this was a sort of myth, a legend that sprung from this kind of exchange of, of views with the police was that, that one of the police took his hat off and turned and joined the, the, the throng of protesters. And I'm not sure that happened, but it's symbolic of what did happen, which was a lot of sympathy was expressed by the Spanish police. And, um, for example, there was one, a couple of guys that got got caught in the woods, you know, with a heat seeker helicopter over and, you know, and the mo police motorbikes and stuff. They got them, took them off to the, the head of the local police, who sat them down and said, I, I'm totally sympathetic to you towards you, what you're doing. Uh, off you go. Uh, which, and they went, oh, OK, wow, that was a bit... Uh, so, you know, the, yes, they're absolutely they're human beings. I don't know whether you will get quite that level of sort of sympathy in... Um, mm -hmm. Chantilly, Virginia, 15 minutes up the road from the CIA. I noticed that uh, yesterday the, the British police were, were marching on uh, yeah. Westminster and uh, all the police had their caps pulled down. Was that <laughs> to avoid the CCTV cameras? Or I, I, I thought it was <laughs> That's bizarre. A mess. It was bizarre. Everyone yeah. had a baseball cap on. Yeah. But, um, but I didn't see any kettle. I didn't see any kettling of the police. They didn't, they didn't the kettle march. themselves. No. no. <laughs> So we're going to uh, we're going to do a little um, look through your your Bilderberg family album here. Okay. Uh, let's go to image one ten. And Charlie, you just just walk us through these images. Okay. As we cue them up. What's going on here? Okay. Well, that's a nice. This is taken by uh, uh, a guy who uh, he just decided to come along. He's a, a British guy. Came along uh, and thought, you know what? I'm going to try and do some do some journalism because the mainstream news aren't doing their job. Who's, who's in this picture? Uh, it was, this was, uh, we, at the front we've got uh, Joseph Ackerman, who's the, the head of Deutsche Bank. Okay. So the guy on the front right. Uh, and he is, if you want to start anywhere in Bilderberg, I would re highly recommend you just Google uh, Joseph Ackerman. Joseph Do Ackerman. Dr. Joseph Ackerman. Uh, he's the head of Deutsche Bank. He's a non-executive uh, director of Shell. And in fact, Shell is very, very heavily represented in, in Bilderberg. It's probably the largest uh, corporate presence is, is Shell. You've got... As is the Dutch elite. Yeah, well, you've got, you've got the... Uh, Queen Beatrice. Queen, Queen Beatrix is Prince there. Royal, Royal Dutch Shell, yeah. yeah. Well, Prince Bernhardt, yeah. Uh, God rest his little SS soul. She's the bicycle queen. Uh, okay, right. Beatrice, that's what they call her. Yeah, but you know, have a look at the list of, of uh, people in terms of Shell, and you can pick out the chairman, uh, Jorma Olila. You've got the... Uh, the deputy chairman, Lord Kerr, uh, K-E-R-R, -R. he's very interesting, Sir John Kerr. Uh, uh, so you've got a lot of, she of shell people. Uh, and so Ackerman, he, he kind of sits across lots of different things. He's on the steering committee, so he's in the kind of inner sanctum of, of Bilderberg. And he also, uh, to show you the kind of people they are in terms of their international roles that they play, he's head of uh, the Institute of International Finance, which is the group that was... Uh, representing the uh, private investors in Greek debt, and they were ne renegotiating their haircut, kind of the, the Greek debt. Ackerman, Ackerman. Is in, yeah, Ackerman is in charge of that negotiation. He's steering, he's steering so, Greek, the Greek haircut. Yeah, he, he couldn't have any more fingers and any more pies if he tried. Okay. Um, so he's a good person to have a look at. And you sort of look at his CV and you go, okay. And I'm starting to get a sense of the kind of people that are 
that are here and the level that they're operating at, and it's mm -hmm. an extremely high level. And you said earlier, what is, what is Bilderberg? And you know, one of the other things I think it is, it's kind of where, where real power just creeps down enough so you can see it, because it's in contact with the, with the, with the rest of the world. You sort of have that, you kind of got the middle managers, the politicians, mm -hmm. and they're kind of invited in, and, there's the, and you sort of get a, you, just at that moment, you sort of see that, I was going to say the tip of the iceberg, but it's kind of upside down. You know, because because they get together, they yeah. only get together once a year. Yeah. So then you have um, uh, is is Bill Gates? Is he is he has he been to any Bilderbergs? To uh, I don't know, but he's uh, got. Uh, I know the you've got of... Craig Mundy from uh, who's the chief. Uh, oper what is he? He's one of the uh, chief finance officer. No, chief research operator or, officer or something of of uh, Microsoft. So he's a big Microsoft guy, mm -hmm. Craig Mundy, and um, pharmaceutical heads. Will they be well, there? Uh, oh God, it's just, just 20 questions. Yeah. Uh, head of Nestle, he's head of there. Nes I love Nestle. him. We've got a lovely photo of him. Which I, unfortunately, I haven't given to you. But Procter and uh, Gamble. Yeah, we've got him, well. him there with his going off to his helicopter with his shirt open. Let's look at 103, queue up 103. And uh, this is from your little snapshot collection. Yeah, I mean, that was in Greece again. And that was when I, uh, I think this was just as I was about to be arrested. Again, for the sort of thirteenth time. And, Did you um, see who was inside this particular limo? No, we didn't. But you know, you, you take enough shots of enough limos, and occasionally you get lucky. Yeah. And you see. So, and it, what, what's interesting about the shots of people in limos is quite often they're kind of cowering down. They've got, we've got a wonderful shot of a guy with a copy of the Financial Times, and he's sort of like this. Yeah, right? I remember David Rockefeller at yeah. Chantilly, like, like down here, yeah. like this. And I, I wrote about this actually in the Guardian. That the feeling I get when I see someone, you know, doing this as the car goes past is real genuine embarrassment mm. on, on, on their behalf. I just think, what are you doing, you child? Yeah. That is not how an adult enters a building. Yeah. You know, it's at like least, a, you know, there's a... What it's like a, a vampire at sunrise. It's just like... Uh, it's just I, more like a teenager, stroppy teenager. Like, yeah. you know, don't look at me. Yeah. And um, at least there was a weird thing that happened in Sa um, Sam Ritz where they all went on a, on a sort of country walk. Uh, not all of them, like a group of them, including like Eric Schmidt from Google and Lord Mandelson. And anyway, they go down the hill. But at least Tom, Thomas Enders, for the head of Airbus, has a kind of conversation with some of the activists there. Let's look at 102. You know, Queue up 102. Who's, who, uh, tell us about this chap. Now, that's uh, Vossa. He's from... Uh, I, I just like this shot because it's slightly embarrassing for him because he's just quietly adjusting himself in the hotel lobby. <laughs> and... Uh, I just like publishing that image wherever I can. It's just, you know, it's, yeah. it's amusing. A uh, I get, I get a, a moment of vulnerability for the, the global elite there. So, yeah, he's, I think he's Shell again. Um, and 101, Cube 101. What's going on here? Oh, yeah, in the middle. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, Henri de Castries in the middle. His, uh, he is the new boss of Bilderberg. There's, they've had a kind of, it's, it's been a real shake-up for them in the last year. Um, just after the last conference, uh, uh, Kissinger resigned as kind of the... Henry Kissinger. Yeah, Henry Kissinger, uh, who managed to be, go to Spain and be wanted as a war criminal in Spain at the same That's time, right, but yeah. without being arrested. So, you know, slippery I think fish. Pinochet managed the same feat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he's kind of stepped down from Bilderberg, and this guy's... Um, stepped up, Henri de Castries, and he's an interesting uh, fellow. He is um, head of AXA Insurance, which is, and I'm going to get this wrong, I apologise, it's something like the eighth biggest company in the world or mm -hmm. something like that. So when you go, when people go, are they really big players? And you go, yeah, the head of it is, you know, head of one of the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, he's the guy now, the new, the new blood, and there's a lot of new blood. There's like, um, uh, the sort of Facebook crowd. Yeah, we're gonna ne on the next segment. Yeah. We're gonna go into the social network. Okay, yeah, because they're they're the, they're all the, the young Turks are building. The young Turks are definitely uh, yeah, yeah they're in. But the so the Council on Foreign Relations ch uh, would, and the equivalent of that in the UK is Chatham House. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now these are these are globalist think tanks. Yeah. Okay. Now do they sit under the Bilderberg Group? Is the Bilderberg kind of like Bilderberg Holding Company PLC? And its its subsidiaries are the Council mm -hmm. on Foreign Relations to govern U.S. foreign policy, Chatham House, uh, the, the the British foreign policy, and then you have the Rand Corporation mm -hmm. and some of these big think tanks in Washington. How, how do you how can you abstract? How can you describe the Bilderberg Group? Like, 
What, what, what is it in comparison to maybe the, the business world or the entertainment world? How, well, would, how would you sum it up? The, 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 the analogy which, because you have to deal in analogies really to, to give it some kind of a shape because it's a, it's a big and complicated and not very visible thing. Um, you know, it's a bit like touch of the blind men touching the elephant kind of thing. I think it's got a trunk, it's got a, you know. Uh, anyway, I, the best analogy I've got is that it's the um, cabinet it's the cabinet of the world government. So if you think of um, the British cabinet government... When you say uh, world government, and some people out there are going to be like, what's he talking about? There is no world government. Just well, I, the way give it me a functions, caveat on okay, that. The, well, the way it, I, when I say world government, I would probably have to then say, uh, sorry, I don't really mean world government. I mean kind of the Anglo-Dutch-American empire. The governing... Of the, uh, yeah, broadly of the West. The you unofficial know. governing empire. Yeah. N not in name, but in form. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, with its history of banking interests and 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 its military industrial, you know, the, it, mm -hmm. the, you know, let's call it the, what Eisenhower, the military industrial complex, mm -hmm. you know, or the, the the prison industrial complex. Some people call it. You know, it, it, it's I like Anglo-Dutch American Empire because I think that gives it a bit of. That's I accurate. think it's reasonable to to give it a bit of history because it's, it is empire, and you can you know when you're wondering. You know, the news today is, you know, when you, these days you look, you turn on the news and it's empire in action. You know, you're getting to watch an empire, what well, some would say dying, others would say flexing its muscles. An, an old correspondent from the Times Tribune told me once, uh, long, long before I got into this, this journalistic game I'm in now, he said, Patrick, he's all, don't be fooled. He said, Britain is the brains and America is the muscle. He's <laughs> like, so he said, the agenda comes out of Britain. And the Americans is the, uh, provide the muscle, they provide the military mm. muscle to execute the plan. Right. And, but the, how, we're, how it's portrayed in the media is like, oh, you know, London and Washington are at mm. odds about this particular trade agreement mm. or so and so. But really, uh, yeah. essentially, that's, that's not the case. Yeah, and if we look at the, if we look at the history of um, uh, uh, Bilderberg, is it's, it's got its roots in the intelligence community, talking of intelligence, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of intelligence meets finance meets military and all of those things and and if you go back enough and into documents you can see how it uh, which I'd happily talk to you a little bit about because it's something I've, I've, you know I've been going to the looking at the documents and reading you know it's like Alex Jones always says go back read the documents read the documents and you can read the documents and it's all there and you can see how it was formed and and, you can, and through its birth you can kind of get a sense of what it really is and how it operates. Well in the next break we're going to get into Bilderberg technology, who are the technology players there, and especially social media. We're talking about Facebook, we're talking about Twitter, we're going to talk about the Arab Spring and how this fits into the Bilderberg world.